This podcast is proudly sponsored by Gyro Drilling. They provide world-class drilling solutions for all types of projects. They specialize in auger, air core, and RC drilling. Head to the team at Gyro Drilling for all your mining needs and see how they can help you with your upcoming project. Hello, I'm Ben Kostrich, and this is the Market Bull Podcast. As this podcast grows, every subscriber helps. From those of you who watch this on YouTube or to those that listen on Spotify and Apple, every follower helps. If you do this one favor and hit follow on whatever platform you find us on, I promise I will continue to look and find fascinating people across the world and bring their perspectives to you. Thank you and enjoy this episode. So hello, I'm Ben Kostrich and this is the Market Bull Podcast. Joining me today in the studio is Phil Russo, the CEO and Executive Director of Tabani Resources, which is listed on the ASX under code TRE. It's a West African exploration company in the gold arena and we know gold has exploded on the spot price uh, recently, so it must be quite fun being a gold explorer at the moment, but welcome to the show, Phil. Oh, thanks for having me, Ben. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, we're talking, there's been a fair bit of activity from your end, but I always like to get to know who I'm speaking with and a bit of their story and how they get to where they are. So for those that are unfamiliar with your story and your exposure with the mining scene, tell us a little bit about your backstory. Yeah, so yeah, I'm over 20 years experience in the industry. Um, I was just saying to someone the other day, you know, you know and I'm not one of the older uh, more seasoned guys, mm. but even I remember gold at 500 bucks an ounce. So um, in the 2000s, so that's you know shows you how far mm. we've come. But yeah, I, I started at, at my days at Barrick here in Australia, and then ended up in North America with Barrick, and then crossed to the dark side of capital markets and at a US investment bank, and then back. Uh, so I lived in Canada there for 10 years, and then ended up back in. Uh, back home in Perth in Australia here and and then jump between a few different corporates, um, most recently uh, Perseus and then into this position at, at Tabani. Okay. And then, again, the opportunity to, to jump onto this project, I mean, what was the I guess, inclination to, to take on this role in, in West Africa? Oh, look, I, I was very excited uh, when this one came across my desk and I'm sure we'll get into it mm. today, but... Um, really compelled me with this opportunity is it's not a drill hole story. It already had $100 million of invested capital in here before I joined the company. It's had a, you know, 160,000 metres of drilling already put into this into this asset. And, and, a, and for me, it was about sort of steering it towards an outcome. Um, and so there was that uh, component to, that was really appealing Regionally, this is a district. There's, a, we'll talk about it as well. Mm. There's other companies drilling and exploring around us, and so there was ways to really unlock value and and make money for shareholders. It really uh, enticed me, and, and I think it it draws upon my skill set here because you know we're in a we're in study phase. That's where I cut my teeth at Barrick in in the study area, and so um, yeah, this is an exciting time for Tabani, which is since I joined been this 12 month journey to get to this position now where we've got a line of sight on the study and so mm. that's why I'm very very excited from here and that's what motivated me to join because I can see an asset here that uh, won't stay a project for too long it'll become a mine and that's what we're here for. So then the history of this this project I mean if we paint the picture where Tabani is and, and I mean some of the history about it, I mean 100 million previous work done is no small amount I mean talk us through that whole area that package and uh, yeah again how how have you guys now stumbled across this really quite nice yeah, opportunity yeah well, look if you look at our share register there's a lot of there's a few very smart resource funds uh on our register that for our market cap uh sort of speaks to well, why are they here and mm. there's because there's, there's a very strong uh opportunity here at the at the asset level and so um this 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 assets had different incarnations in, in its history uh, dating in, in Canada uh, and I think that's where these Australian uh, funds uh, got involved, agitated for change and then we brought it to the AS, they brought it to the ASX and then that's when I joined in early 2023 and the company's had a complete refresh so we've, we were fortunate to inherit all that, all that work and money spent 
but from the board down to ma senior management to technical teams, we've done a complete refresh and rebadge. And that's, um, yeah, so people, way people looked at the asset in the past as um, either a small or a high grade project or um, too low a grade, um, we've been able to reposition it. Now we've got really clear line, on site, line of sight what we think will be a really attractive project. And so um, that's the origins. It's the, there's been a couple of, call it false starts, mm. um, that haven't gained traction in the market. Um, but we think we're on, we've got the project on the right rails here to deliver something the market's going to like. Yeah, gotcha. And you were saying before about some of the success in that surrounding area. Um, I mean, again, West Africa, there's quite a few big miners that are inhabiting that that area. And mm -hmm. you're, you're in Mali, if I'm correct in, in saying that's where the project is. I mean, who's in that surrounding area around you guys? I mean, what success have they got? And then, I mean, this is leading to the path we'll deep down into the, the main project. But Yeah, look, we're in southern Mali and we make no apologies about that. So... Mm -hmm. You know, if you go through all these West African uh, countries, they all have their peaks and troughs in terms of the, the political backdrop. Yeah. Uh, and so Mali, you know, Mali is a, is a mining powerhouse, right? It's the third biggest gold producer in Africa or West Africa, I forget mm. exactly that one. Um, and its its mining industry is very mature. Like the institutions of mining have been there for decades and... There are big companies. The biggest gold mines in West Africa are in Mali. So Barrick, the biggest gold mine in the world, has has a big project in a big asset in Mali. There's B2 Gold with Fakola, big big. These are talking 500,000 ounce a year production uh, assets. And there's Resolute that everyone's aware of. Mm. And there's Allied that just completed an IPO using a Mali asset, Sadiola, to underpin that IPO. So. And there's heaps of explorers and aspiring developers. There's, you know, Leo Lithium is there. There's other lithium guys coming through. So the, it's the biggest contributor to their, to their GDP. Um, and so it's no flash in the pan country. So it, it understands mining. Its supply chains are all there to support mining. Um, and, uh, yeah, the, we don't have any expats on site, right? It's all Malians and they do a great, great job. And so when I look at a country... What, what are the two things as an investor you, you want to see and hear? And one is to have local community support and we have that, uh, we have five villages around us, they all want to see a mine built. And secondly, does the government support mining? Mm. And you can't say that Mali doesn't support mining. It, it clearly wants to have a, mining, a relevant mining industry. I, I don't know if you can say those same things for South America. Yeah. You know, like you get strong community protests on assets there and you've got governments that can do... It's a pretty wild thing. So if you've got those two ingredients, the rest is just noise or risk you have to navigate your way through. Yeah. And you know, that's that doesn't sort of keep me up at night, but that's just things we got to navigate having an asset in West Africa. Yeah, undoubtedly there's always that term thrown around of sovereign risk and, and almost people have their biases on because it's not in a tier one jurisdiction or whatever, there's inherent risks. And I think no matter what exploration game you're in, there are risks and it's more about... Well, understanding how you, you get those sorts of ticks of approval and then it's, well, we shouldn't really differentiate between where it is. But if we drill down, pun intended, on the actual flagship project, talk us through a little bit about that project and why it's quite unique. Because when I was going through some of the, uh, I guess, presentations and some of the work, it's a little bit different to other gold projects, other gold explorers, at least from my understanding. So, yeah, a little bit of information about that. Yeah, look, Kabata... If Kabata was in WA, it would have been mined out 50 years ago. So, um, but it's in West Africa and, you know, there's an audience of uh, capital and suitors and corporates all, you know, plying their trade in West Africa. And what's appealing about Kabata is the wealth of this soft rock material that, that we have. So our weathering profile, this free dig material goes down... 70 metres on average, but we see it more like 100 metres in, in, in places, plus 100 metres mm. in places. And it's quite a unique um, advantage for the project because that's – so no drill and blast, free dig. Um, we've got a low strip here, high recovery. So um, you've got all the ingredients 
and this is what we we say quite a lot is it's margin over grade we've just fixated on getting our all in sustaining costs as low as you can right so it's because if you look at the bigger producers what's underpinning them are these assets d- delivering lots and lots of cash and and they and it's a low asset profile and so that's what we're fixated on and that's what Kapata can do given the abundance of this soft rock ore. Um, and so it's four and a half kilometre long pit and it's a simple project. We're just talking about a, a rock factory here. We're just going to bulk it out, put it through a big mill and produce uh, a lot of gold per year hopefully in this DFS that we're looking to deliver. But um, I'm only talking about the oxide potential in one pit. We've got that's in five kilometres of strike. There's 50 kilometres of shear zones on Jeez. our property and there's a fresh material here that's we're just not even focused on drilling. So, you know, historically there was a, a diamond drill hit here of nine metres at 21 grams in the hard rock. We're not pursuing that. Like that's an opportunity down the road. So, you know, we're going to talk about risk all through mm. this conversation but it always get back to our investors compensated for risk. And in our stock today, you are compensated for risk in a rising gold market so the value of our deposit continues to go up and we're delivering and we're unlocking it through the th- – we're delivering through our drilling and we're going to unlock the value in it through the study. So hard assets have a value, right? So, you know, you, you, you – you can sort of buy to Barney and put it away right mm. now and uh, check back on it in a few months. Interesting. So then again, going back a little bit to when you first joined, I mean, was that part of the process that you started setting up was finding out which the best route forward would be to transition to better results for shareholders? I mean, that was that part That's of good, it at the beginning? Or? Good question. So when I joined, you know, I, I quickly brought on a technical team to support me and and – it was last year was largely a journey in terms of understanding what Kobata could be. So, you know, we inherited a 2021 study. There was a lot of good work done there. Um, but for some reason, the market wasn't finding traction with that, 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 those parameters of that project. So we went almost back to basics. So we redid the resource. We used Entech, a tier one consultant mm. in Australia to do that. We then brought in Allergy, uh, so we redid the resource. We then brought Allergy in to run optimizations on this new resource to understand what throughput can this deposit support. And we were looking at throughputs. The, the 2021 study was 3 million tonnes a year. We're looking at throughputs up to double that mm. uh, and try and understand what the project could support. And then we used Lyco initially, and we announced this, uh, to run – you know, we use the latest CapEx and costs assumptions – to understand what this project could economically deliver, what was the most attractive NPV uh, to CapEx, to production, to grade, to ASIC, what what should this project look like? And that's what we worked on last year. And then we lasered in on what we wanted to do. And then this year we went and defined a real targeted drill program. So that's the drilling results you're seeing in the market today. Some yes. cracking hits like 71 metres at 1.86 and... 45 metres at 2.8 and 19 metres at 20 grams, like a timely reminder to the market who hasn't been on the Kabata's journey for long in Australia that this thing has, you know, a lot, a lot of juice, right? Yeah. And so um, that's that drilling now underpin us going full steam head into the study that we know, you know, internally where we're, we're striving to get it towards um, and that's what we're trying to deliver on. And that's part of the roadmap forward, isn't it? And I mean, we talk about the capital raising as well, but the definitive feasibility study and its importance. I mean, for many, uh, you know, you see that phrase or even those those three those three letters put up on on I guess the roadmap. But I mean, why is that so important to get done? And what are you guys hoping that it will help show in regards to getting this project further down the pipe to you know making it into a mine? Yeah, all our decisions about taking this from project to mine like what are the decisions that whether it's Tabani or someone else that makes this thing take the leap from project to mine look we don't want to keep spinning wheels here as a project we've got critical mass today and so um we can drill forever at Kabata you will this thing will grow um for you know many for years years to come that's not the problem the problem is how do you get this to go from project to mine in a tougher regional dynamic Mm. uh, but you've got a rising gold price and so we're trying to get 
we're, we're striving for the lowest technical risk project we can do, which is why we think it's better at scale. Um, and and we think that will, will um, be attractive to a broader suite of uh, broader audience, uh, whether it's the corporates, the private equities, the financiers, and you need to get the project to that relevant scale and attractiveness, just given the political the, the risk profile yeah, right now. de-risking the whole yeah. sort of environment. I, of if you, you need an exceptional project to attract um, what you need to take this from project to mine. And so we're trying to push this project that extra extra mile here so that it can become um, a fundable or financeable project that can become a mine because uh, Marley certainly wanted to become a mine. And then when you're looking at that, I mean, what, what are the sort of timelines in place to have this ticked off? I mean, is that towards the end of this year or early into next year and then – I mean, without putting too far ahead, I mean, of course, you've got to be thinking to the future. What happens after that? Is that when you get the re-rating and then the financing and then that next evolution? Or what's what's yeah. going through there? Yeah, so look, we're, we're trying to put a bow on this thing. And so um, we're telling the market that will and this capital raise is to deliver that feasibility study in the third quarter. And then from there, um, we'll move into... Uh, sort of early engineering work and convention agreement discussions with Marley as it approaches that FID milestone sometime in... in FID, 20, if I may. Um, final investment decision. Ah, gotcha. Cool. Uh, approach that type of milestone, say, mid-2025. And there's not many um, study-level projects in Africa, period. Um, and certainly in terms of the timeline to someone being able to press a construction decision button on an asset where we one of the more advanced mm. projects in that in that regard. So um, so loosely, yeah, that's what we're aiming for here is study in the third quarter and then we'll shift into those uh, the other de-risking things like the convention agreement, which is uh, the final agreement you have to agree with Mali and you start some early engineering work and, and some other in-country work in 2025 to that FID milestone. Gotcha. So there's a fair bit happening with that priority. And you said at the outset about the the indications that you guys got, which was working with the Mali government, but also the local communities. And I mean, going in initially with that, you probably had to build up relationships or inherit relationships. I mean, how did those discussions go, given that I can imagine you're probably flying there and seeing the people a fair bit? Or what's the, I guess, you know, team on ground, you said a lot of locals. How did you sort of build that into the whole company structure as well? Yeah, look, um, yeah, we've, we're fortunate enough to have a really strong in-country team. Uh, but when I go to Mali, I always make a point of just going down to site and seeing – it's an easy site to get to from Bamako – but going to see um, the villages and the village chiefs because um, we need their support uh, for the mine. And, and they, they say to me – Whereas to the effect that we just want to see this become a mine because the project's been there for, for so some some time. And so they fi- they just want to see it developed. Uh, developed <laughs> and they say things like they want, you know, their sons to work at the mine, things like that. And so, um, you know, we, we, we do what we can with our budget constraints to support the local hospitals and schools and, you know, we did our inaugural soccer game with them, Very Tabani cool. versus the villagers. Um uh, this year, and so, um, yeah, I, we're we're lucky in that regard that they they want to see some investment down there, um, and then the Mali state. Well, that's that's another set of uh, dynamics. Yeah, gotcha. And going back to the capital raise point of view, I mean, we're recording now. It's it's just come out that you guys are raising I think it's four million or just under for the definitive definitive feasibility study. I mean. Mm. Talking through the reasons behind that, of course, good to have some cash in the bank balance. But I mean, where do you see that potentially progressing? And what was the uh, appetite from investors, you know, current and, and new ones that came on board? Yeah, look, it was a really well supported raise. Like, um, yeah, I was very happy with the outcome. Um, in uh, new institutions we had, we brought on board and, you know, follow the smart money in, in, uh, is uh, s- something I would suggest, like uh, some some pretty smart guys um, running, running resource yeah. funds participated and uh, and it gets me back to this, you know, hard assets have a value in the mm. gold sector. It doesn't matter the cycle. And these guys, you know, they're, acknowledge they're, that. they acknowledge that, they're patient, they know what we're trying to do. Um, so, yeah, that was, it was a really strongly supported raise. 
um, Australian four million dollars, and it'll this will take us to deliver that study, um, um, badged by Lycopodium, and uh, all you know tier one consultants, like I said, uh, being used here so, to do that. So that's what those proceeds will go towards. And again, it's all going towards the Kabata project well, predominantly. Uh, and I mean, the interesting bit that must be going through your mind is you're pushing, progressing that towards development, but you said you've still got a huge amount of other area to explore, or potentially start considering mm. and thinking about that in the back of the mind. Is there much sort of thought process about how you even approach it or is it all just full steam ahead, get this one done, dusted, get the DFS, get it yeah. into you know, the rewriting and the production? I mean, what's really going through the brain there? Look, it's a good question, right? And I think about it every day. What, where sh- should we spend the dollars to get the best outcome for shareholders, right? And we came to the view that if this gets back to our back to basics technical work yeah. where we redid the resource and ran optimizations. I spend a million dollars drilling, infill drilling this deposit and converting waste to ore, hopefully. Hmm. Uh, and that, that million dollars unlocks X million dollars in NPV value for the project. So to me, that's value accretive for shareholders. We can go and drill these regional structures, which we did last year, and we got hits on all these new targets. Um, but the market's not paying you for that um, today. You know, mm. it's a choppy market. They're not, they're not paying, they're not rewarding companies for doing that per se. So for us, it was how do we get this project to be where it needs to be and that was the best pathway the most expedient pathway to realize value for shareholders and get and get the share price to respond it was engineering and and res dev drilling here that's where we thought was the best bang for buck um and that's what we're doing but if we had and who Again, know, we'll, yeah. we'll <laughs> see what we're working on through the next 12 months if we're fortunate to be where we have that surplus cash, then we'll go away and we we could drill out resources on these other on these other shear zones, these other targets. Yeah, that that's not something that'll again lose sleep about. Um, but it's about what where where what pathway is going to get this asset to get traction in the market. I think that's the one we're on. And the point I didn't actually press you further on was you said if this was in Australia or Canada, it would have been gone fifty odd years ago, mm-hmm. and talked about why it's a low cost operation given its differences and for me not having much of a a background within why why is this resource unique in that regard that if it wasn't australia it would have been taken and now it's you know it's a low cost operation Mm. talk us through i guess why that's the case oh look i make that statement because it's a near surface shallow simple pit you know a lot of the old timers in wa all these several of these projects that you see you know, they're cutbacks on a previous pit that was mined out X yeah. years ago. And um, I'm not a geologist, but, you know, I don't see too many projects here with an abundance of oxide ore. You're generally pretty quickly into the hard rock. Mm. Um, whereas we've basically all the drilling that you've seen so far this year is all oxide intersections. And so um, something about that Sagiri Basin there where the weathering profile goes quite deep. But, yeah, Africa's a little bit behind and it's – evolution to uh, you know these assets and so you still have those opportunities why companies go to west africa you can find um assets there you wouldn't necessarily find here in, in a crowded australian market per se yeah, yeah. I, I saw it on the on the one of the presentations pretty much comparing the two the hard rock versus the oxide and showing a lot of the stages within that i guess mining process that get removed and you just see that as you know, there's no cost needing to be associated which mm. well hey fantastic uh, yourself, uh, you being the CEO, I can imagine you've brought in a bit of expertise in country, but also back here. I mean, who's been supporting you and around you and building this team from a you know board perspective, but also just to the, the technical and and the others within the company? Yeah, yeah, we've got a um, so we, on, on our board, we've got an ex Glencore mine builder uh, uh, person on there. We've got um, another ex World Gold Council. Um, large cap mining CEO uh, in North America, a highly connected guy. And then we've got another guy who's got a track record of uh, realising value in these in this junior end of town. So we're feeling pretty, pretty strong about the board. And then in the management team, we've got no shortage of geologists in the company, which is where we took this company back to basics, right? Mm. We redid the resource model. Um, 
in, in say Kerry Griffin and Bill Oliver, they're very mature, seasoned guys, experienced in West Africa. And then you know when you're in the junior end of town, you you got to make your budget last as long as you can and 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 use your resources wisely. So we've surrounded ourselves with some you know very strong consultants, um, like the Lycopodiums, the Orlogies, and the Entex of the world um, to really drive this study now. So. Um, yeah, that, that's the level of expertise. Mm. And like I said, in country, we've got guys there that have been with the project for 15 years, um, so know their way around Mali. And you were saying earlier, even when you started gold price being at 500 and now, you know, from an Australian point of view, it's well over, you know, three and a half. In the US, it's, you know, probably floating around that, two, 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 four, some serious intraday spikes. Uh, I mean, looking at that and, you know, the impact that will have on projects as they come close and closer to production, I mean, but thinking back to last year, did you ever really consider that that was going to be such a a, a rapid increase in, in the gold price? And from Dev's Advocate, do you potentially see it retrenching or going back? And how is that potentially impacting? I mean, it's different being an explorer. As soon as you become a producer, it's a, a much better place. But yeah. how do you see those dynamics impacting Tabani if they do? Uh, look, you know, I used to be a mining analyst and you get asked about the gold question all the time, yeah. I've sort of given up trying. Like there are a <laughs> few, predict it or few, see, few yeah. charts that I look towards, but I, I just sort of keep it simple, right? Like I think you have a, you're pretty hard pressed to come up with arguments to say that gold becomes less relevant in the world, right? It's the, there's some you read this uh, uh, buying selling thematic to gold. I'm not convinced. I think it's you know it's always it's the financial instrument Safe that, that it is yeah. that really underpins and if I, I, I think you can have a hard time convincing me that the risks in the world are abating and gold becomes less relevant I think you've got a much easier time mm. selling a story that gold becomes more relevant and then I would just leave it there that, yeah. that means gold's going to be relevant yeah. and, and I'm not surprised to see it uh, go through what it's going through now. We, we were you know, in the doldrums for a few mm. years here. So, you know, gold price is there and that's the first bell. Whether it's when, when does the market capital start to flow your way? Um, you, know, you, you can make the point that it's coming into the larger caps, but when does it flow yes. to the junior end of town? Um, but that just makes me even more excited about Kabata because we've got the gold price going up. I've got drilling results uh, showing, you know, unlocking value in the project. So it's our hardest time will be what gold price we use in the study, yeah. right? So, um, you know, generally when the gold price is moving, costs go with it. You know, generally, if you go back in time with gold companies, they have sort of a margin that trade, you know, whatever it is, 30 to 40% um, that tracks the gold price. But right now I don't think costs are shooting as fast as no. what the gold price is. So it's... This yeah, is a yeah, great, no, I great think, time to be a put, producer. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, where do you, where do you put <laughs> the mark to be like thinking ahead for all those worst case scenarios? But even if you're using the level from, you know, a year, two years ago, yeah, you'd yeah. be quite comfortable knowing that it's almost a bit of a safe um, spot. Well, but it's, well, we, we're yeah. trying, like I said earlier, we're trying to have a low cost asset here. So you pick your gold price, does the economics should still work, right? Yeah. So like Perseus with Yare, San Brado, West Africa, you know, low cost mines, right? Even in Australia, Capricorn, Gold Road, low cost mines are the ones that mm. work through all the cycles. Yeah. And so, Kubata, you know, if it if all this oxide ore is what we're talking about exists here, then it should have a low cost structure because that's the cheapest ore, mm. right? So, that's what we've been underpinning our strategy is that. Interesting. Yeah, it all goes back to the beginning <laughs> bit, which I was like, yeah, it just seems like a again, a, a quite a luxury in the regards to not having to, to worry about hard rock, at least at the moment. And I always encapsulate conversations like this with, with key takeaways. And I think there's there's probably quite a few more than three. But if you were to summarise the conversation that we had with three key takeaways that investors should keep in mind going towards, you know, 20, end of 2024, potentially into 2025, I mean, what would some of those key points and considerations be? Yeah, Look, uh, for me... Doesn't have to be three. It no, be but look, I'll just try to summarise it succinctly. Yeah. You know, we've just raised capital. We've been de-risking this project. And uh, as an investor, you can buy a, a, a portfolio of stocks. I would just strongly encourage you to add to money into that mix. Um, 
and don't you know don't sweat it day by day. Just let, put it in the portfolio and let us get to work because uh, right now lots of the heavy lifting's been done, and now we've just got to go and be really measured and smart about how we go about this study, deliver that study, and 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 hopefully surprise the market to the upside and its potential. Um, and again. There'll be headlines that come out of West Africa from a geopolitical perspective, but again, I focus you on those two things about a, a country that you should just care about, local and government support. And finally, are you compensated for the risk? Like, okay, we trade at $5 an ounce, right? And uh, companies that get taken out of West Africa get taken out at 50 bucks an ounce. Yeah. My peers are trading at $13 an ounce. Like you're compensated for the risks that we've been talking about. So I think, you know, you just focus on that. You can see that in the last 18 months, advanced development asset West Africa find a, find a home and good projects become mines and that's what we're trying to do with Kibata. And so if you focus on that, I think you can't really go wrong here at, what are we, 12 cents a share mm. uh, today. Yeah, no, I think that's a perfect summary, to be fair. Like, that's almost that the podcast done in about a minute and a half. But done but, a few of these. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds like it. From the people wanting to follow this story now and potentially stay in contact with yourself or just mm. the team there, I mean, where can listeners and viewers go to monitor Tabani other than just the, the ASX announcements and uh, putting it in their watch lists? Yeah, you're always in co- you, can, you can contact me anytime. Uh, if uh, I'll answer any question. Um, but, you know, we've got a socials and things like that but you sign up to the to the subscribe subscriber page on our website and you can email me direct you know at any time and that, that you'll get all the information you need uh on on those things to monitor our progress here so um yeah no oh, good uh, it's i think companies these days you have to be so accessible it's sure even over the last you know handful of years i've never seen ceos be more sort of open to just phone calls and just emails all the time <laughs> uh it feels like a almost a, a job that you signed up for that you weren't necessarily expecting to do it all but now mm-hmm. it's just part of the, the job but yeah thank you so much phil for taking the time to speak with me there's a lot going to be happening over the the next 12 plus months um and an exciting area as, as we've talked about but yeah thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me no, on the show no, thank thanks for having us mate it was a nice conversation but yeah uh anyone can contact us anytime we'll be, we're, we're uh, always open thanks for listening to the marketable podcast please remember that the topics and stocks discussed in this podcast are not financial advice if you enjoyed this episode please make sure to like share and follow You can follow The Market Bull on all our socials and keep up to date with global market insights.